So we've talked about to this point, just to remind you, what, what is communion? We had communion together. As you remember, we talked about what that actually is and why we do that as a church, and I hope that was explained well. We followed that up with a message about salvation, not what the Baptists believe or Methodists believe or Presbyterians believe, but what does the Bible actually teach us about what it truly means to be saved? Because that's all that matters. I really enjoyed going through that. We followed that up with a message about the Trinity something rarely preached on, and we gave the Holy Spirit his own message because we do know that that he's the redheaded stepchild of the Trinity. And so we spent a whole week following that, talking about the Holy Spirit. And last week we had a precious time, an unusual time in our church's life, but a time to set apart a precious guy, John Weiss, who we love so, and to serve as an elder in our church. And we talked about what ordination is and why churches do that. And today we come and talk about a, a very controversial subject in Cleveland, Tennessee, can I say, and that is eternal security. What does the Bible have to say about eternal security? In other words, if a person is truly born again by the Spirit of God, can they lose their salvation? If you're truly born again, if you're truly a Christian, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, can you lose your salvation? That is a very controversial subject in this town. So let me do this before we go any any further. Y'all ready for this? I'm going to pull my sleeves of. Y'all ready for this? We're going to dive right in. We talked about a few weeks ago three simple things I want to remind you of. Number one, what is the authority of salvation? The authority of salvation is God's holy word. It is the only source we have in this world to teach us about the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. There are other books that have been written about that, but they were all taken from this book. And so we thank God for his Bible because it is his love letter to us to remind us it, he is the absolute, it's the authority for salvation. Number two, the author of our salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. No question about that according to Scripture. He is the way, the truth, the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So he is the author of our salvation. We follow it up with the access to salvation, which is faith. The Bible makes it abundantly clear we are not saved by our good works. We're not saved by being better than the next guy. We're not saved because we go to church. We're not saved because we get baptized. We're saved by faith in Christ Jesus Christ. And so we we talked about that, and I want to remind you that with all that biblical evidence I just gave to you, yet there are still people, and I've met them, you've met them. I've had some incredible conversations with pastor friends that I have about this topic because they believe that a person can genuinely be born again by the Spirit of God, and they can lose their salvation. So let me real quickly put a parenthesis here. What I'm talking about today is not a person who said, I went to youth camp when I was 14, and I said a prayer, and I got baptized, and voila, I know I'm saved. The Bible says that we're not known by our baptism. We're not known by something that we went through that the church told us about. The Bible says we're known by our fruit. What am I saying? We do not work to be saved, but once we are truly saved, there will be fruit in our lives that will show the world that something has changed on the inside of us. You cannot be changed. You cannot come to Christ in the free pardon of sin and stay the same. It just doesn't work that way. And so if there is no fruit in your life that shows the world that something truly changed on the inside of you, that is not the person I'm talking about. The world is filled. Churches are overloaded with people that went through some routine or some class or said some prayer, but nothing ever changed in their life. That is not what I'm talking about. So hear this today. I'm not saying, well, I said a prayer, and I got my fire insurance prayed up, and I'm going to heaven one day and go live any old way. That is not what I'm talking about. Can a person truly repent of their sin and with a whole heart give their life to Christ and be saved and then lose their salvation? I have a pastor friend in town, and I don't care. I think he wouldn't even care if I had this conversation with him right in front of you. But years ago, we got in a great debate about this, and it was fun. He said, you know, Phil, I grew up in a day and time when they said if you dropped your gum on the sidewalk and didn't go back and pick it up and and throw it in the garbage can that you were going to go to hell, basically. Y'all met those people before? If I die with sin in my life, I'm going to hell. Breaking news. Every person who has ever lived, is living now, will ever live, is going to die with sin in their life. And so no one is going to get saved if that's your criteria. And so I said to this guy, his pastor friend, he's a dear friend of mine, and he was really on the side, yeah, you can lose your salvation. You can genuinely be saved and lose your salvation. So let me ask you a question. What did you do, my brother, to deserve to be saved? 
And he had to admit, he goes, I didn't do anything. So tell me, how, how can you not do anything to be saved, but do something to lose your salvation? That doesn't make sense, does it? And I'll never forget, he goes, we'll just have to agree to disagree. There was no debate. How can you not do, by the way, no one ever did anything to deserve to be saved. We're going to talk a lot more about that before we're through this morning. So how can you do something to lose it? Well, think, that, think about that for a minute. And let's look at this passage of Scripture this morning. We're going to come back to this at the end, but I want to read it right now. In John chapter 6, man, this is so good. Oh, the Bible's so good. All the Father, verse 37, chapter 6. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given to me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. And then finally these words in verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. Father, these are your words, and this is your message. And God, I want to be your messenger. And I pray, Father, over a very hard subject in Cleveland, Tennessee, that you would help me, Father, to communicate your word effectively, truthfully, and that, Father, we'll all leave very encouraged, Father, by your word today. That's my prayer, and I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Write some things down. Let's walk through a little outline, just some simple things here real quickly. Number one, there's five absolute truths I want to share with you related to salvation. Five important truths before we go any further and eventually come back to this text that I want to make sure you hang your head on today. Number one, salvation is of the Lord. Don't forget that. Salvation is of the Lord. I could literally stand here for the next hour and read scriptures that back that up, but let me give you a few. In Jonah chapter 2 and verse 9, from the belly of a whale, people always say, you know, Phil, do you really believe that that's a true story? Yes, I do. If it said that Jonah swallowed the whale and it's in the Bible, I'd believe it. Can I get an amen from the congregation? But from that belly of the whale, he literally said these words, salvation comes from the Lord. In Revelation chapter 7 and verse 10, it says, The multitudes cried out, Salvation is from our God who sits on the throne. In Psalm 51, verse 12, a verse we all know so well, David prayed literally this Restore to me the joy of thy salvation. I hear that misquoted all the time. They'll say, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. No, it's not your salvation, it's his salvation. Salvation is of the Lord. Now, let me just say this. We'll come back and probably say this again. You need to hear this. Salvation is either 100% a work of God or it's not. And if it is not, I don't want anything to do with it, and you shouldn't either. You're with me. If salvation has anything to do with how good you are or how clean you are or how sinless you are or how sinless I am, I don't want anything to do with it because I know me too well, and I suspect you know yourself too well. Salvation is 100% a work of God. And so first and foremost, just make sure we hang our head on that. Salvation is of the Lord. Number two, God finishes what he starts. Praise God, God finishes what he starts. And Philippians chapter one and verse six, we know it so well. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in me, I love this, will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. God finishes what he starts. He does, I promise you. He's got you where you are right now, and there's more he wants to do with you. And if you allow him room in your life, there's no telling what he'll do with you. But he, God does not give up on you. I know many of us would say this morning, I'm stunted in my growth, or I found this hard place, or maybe I'm in a really tough place right now. God wants to take you further. He finishes what he starts. He makes his promise to us that he will do that. Number three, eternal life begins the moment you believe. There's a false theology in this world that says only after you've spoken in tongues or only after you've done this or only after you've done Listen to me. If you add anything to this gospel message that Jesus paid it all and all to him that I owe, you're making the biggest mistake you'll ever make. It's all about him. The moment you believe, salvation begins for you. Make sure you hear that. Not the day that you die. Not on that great getting up morning when you go to heaven. Salvation has already began for all of us that are in Christ Jesus. We're living our eternal life now. 
I'm never going to die. I'm going to close my eyes and just wake up in front of Jesus. And so will you if you're in Christ. We need to know that salvation begins the moment that we believe. In John chapter 3 and verse 36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. How about this? John chapter 5 verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not cast judgment, but it says he has passed out of death into life. And then perhaps one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, in John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28, listen to this, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. That's God talking. And we remember years ago, I preached a whole series of messages on when God says he'll promise you something, take him to the bank. He always keeps his word. He's never failed even once to do so. When God makes a promise, listen and believe what he has to say. Number four, when we're in Christ, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Another great passage of Scripture. Listen to this, Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and verse 39. For I'm confident, it says, or I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, or any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Simple statement. Nothing can separate the child of God from the love of God. Nothing, not even you. Think about that for a minute. If he would say in this text again, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor debt, or any other created thing, could we also put in there, or me, or you, can separate us from the love of God. God didn't love us because we deserved it. He did it because he loved us in his grace and his mercy. He loved us. Those, number five, who are born again can never be unborn. Think about that for a minute. If you've been born again, you can never be unborn. In John chapter three, verses three and four, it says, speaking to Nicodemus, he said this, Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And you know, Nicodemus went home and said, what do you mean be born again? I can't get back in my mother's womb, be born again. Once you've been born again, you can't be unborn. You need to know that once you're in Christ Jesus, it is a very secure place to be. Not because of who you are, not because you're awesome, not because you did it so well, it's because of how awesome he is and how incredible his grace and mercy toward us actually is. Just five simple truths to hang your hat on when it comes to salvation. Number two, two absolute temptations related to salvation. You don't really have to turn there, but I'll turn to my Bible just to have it. I don't really need to turn there either, I guess. But in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, one of the greatest passages, you want to memorize some scripture, there's a great place to start. For by grace you're saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. While we're there, verse 10, we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he preordained for us to do. Okay, let's take this a little bit. What is the first temptation that many people have related to salvation? Number one, we trust in the wrong master. Write that down. We trust in the wrong master. For by grace you have been saved through faith, don't miss this, and that not of yourself. Did you hear that? Many of us trust the wrong. If you ever say that my salvation depends upon how good I am or how sinless I am or how many good things I did or that some celestial scale that I did more good things than bad things, you've missed the point altogether. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. If your philosophy or your doctrine of salvation includes anything about you, run, don't walk away. We're just not that good, my friend. We're just not. Hey, listen to me. The goal is perfection. Anybody in here want to stand up and say you're perfect? I'm not. I'm right there in the line with Paul saying, you know, I'm the chief of all sinners. We all fall short. And hear me, if you've sinned once, you're guilty unto death because you can't forgive yourself. And so we're completely 
at his disposal. One of the great mistakes, and it's a temptation we all have, and there are many people in this town that say that. When they say, well, you can lose your salvation because what if you do fill in the blank? What if I do this? What if I do that? What if this is my habit? Whatever. Listen to me. If it includes how good you are, run away. And so the first temptation, again, is that we trust the wrong master. You are not the master of your salvation. Praise God, it's not dependent upon how great you are, but how great he is. Can I get an amen from anybody in this room? Number two, second temptation we have when it comes to salvation is we practice our faith with the wrong motive. We practice our faith with the wrong motive. We go back to this incredible text again, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Listen, not as a result of works, not as a result of works. We practice our faith. There are people, listen, man, I wish I had a way to help you understand this because I think I was this person way too long in my life. God delivered me from this idea. I performed for God for years and years. Listen to me, when I was a teenage boy, I was the boy you prayed that your daughter would, would ask your daughter out on a date. I was that kid. I was running hard and chasing God as hard as any young man you've ever met in your life. Wanted to be as pure as I could be, all those things. And somehow in my mind, I think back then when I was performing for God, I thought God loved me more when I did it right than when I did it wrong. And God taught me something that changed my life forever. He does not love me more when I do it right than when I do it wrong. He just loves me. He wants more for me than I could ever want for myself. But I made a great mistake when I thought, look, God, look how good I'm doing. Look how clean I am. And the truth of the matter is I was a sinner that needed Jesus as bad as anybody that's ever needed Jesus. Listen to me. You can't earn this. You can't be good enough. Stop thinking you're pleasing God by doing it all right. Now, I'm not telling you not to try to chase him. I'm not telling you how to pursue, I want to pursue him and try to be holy and ask God to help you in that process, but don't think that's what's gonna save you. It's not gonna work that way. I wrote this in my notes again. Salvation is a gift. It cannot be earned. It ceases to be a gift the moment you think you can earn it. And then again, verse 10, it says this, we, we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good work. Listen to me. We don't work to be saved. We work because we have been saved. Amen. Oh, my goodness. If you can just get a hold of that and employ that in your life. If years and years and years ago, I got off that treadmill performing for God and just decided, you know what? I'm just going to fall in love with Jesus. And so my motive for doing everything that I do in my life to this day, whether it's being the best dad I can be or husband or best pastor or whatever it may be, my motive is not, look, God, look, I'm, my motive is, God, I love you and I want to do my very best for you. Not because it makes me better. It just shows how incredible you are. Thank you for changing my life, God. Help me live for you, not because I have to, not because the Bible tells me to, but because I love you and I want you to be pleased with my life. It's radically different. My life has been never the same. I got off that treadmill and I, I chased him as hard as I ever did, but the motive is radically different. Stop chasing him because it's the right thing to do. Stop chasing him because, you know, the Bible said that, the preacher said you're supposed to do that, or I was taught that in Sunday school. no. Why don't you just fall in love with Jesus? 41 years ago, I met the prettiest girl I ever met in my life, and, and by the grace of God, 36 years ago, God let me marry her. I haven't gotten over that just yet. I still love her, and I would do anything, include give my life for her, not because I'm supposed to or the Bible tells me I'm supposed to. It's because I love Tracy Cleveland Griffin, and yes, that is her maiden name, Cleveland. How about that? I don't get up every day and say, God, please help me do the right thing by Tracy today because, you know, your word says I should love her the way Christ loves the church. Fooey on that. I love Jesus with all of my heart, and I want to honor him in everything that I do. And I don't have to be told to do that. I love that girl. No one has to make me do that. What a sad truth it is that many people do what they do for God because they're supposed to do it. I wonder how that makes God feel. Well, God... I'm going to worship you today because, you know, in your Bible, you told me I ought to do that. I'm going to try to be a good husband because, you know, your word tells me to do that. God, I'm not going to cheat on my taxes this year because, you know, your Bible says I should be a good. No, come on. Doesn't everything change when you say, God, I love you. 
and I'm going to fall down every day. I'm going to mess up every day, but I'll tell you what. I'm going to get back up if you'll dust me off and try again. When I was in seminary, I'd never had a foreign language. How did I get to all the way, listen, all the way through a bachelor's degree, never had a foreign language. I don't know how that happened, but it happened. Let me tell you a little piece of advice. Don't start with Greek and Hebrew. Just <laughs> Spanish may be a little easier, okay? And probably a little more useful. My first Greek class, I remember sitting there probably, I'd love to have a picture of my face when I left that first class, probably going like, what have I got myself into? And I remember I made an appointment with the professor in the class, and I went to see him. I didn't know him that well, but I just said, sir, I want you to know something. I may fail your class, but I want you to know I'm going to be giving it everything I have. He was such an encouragement to me. And there were times he said, Phil, come on. You knew that. But he coached me through it, and he helped me through it, and I made a B in the class. I still don't know how I did that, but the point is this. I'm so thankful. I am so thankful for his grace and his mercy in helping me through that. And you know what? I didn't have to be told, you know what? You know, if you want to be a really good seminary student, you really need to learn that Greek. And I was wanting to learn that stuff so I could be a better pastor, so I could know him better, so I could know his word better, so one day maybe communicate his word better. And all these years later, 30-something years later, there's not a day that goes by in my life that I don't use what I learned in those classes in what I do with my life. Every day when I'm in the study, I'm thankful for the things that I learned or whatever, but the motive was totally different. I wasn't just seeking to get a degree. I was seeking to be better prepared to serve my Savior because I love him. I really do. Don't you? I praise God for salvation, but I, I chase him, and I hope you chase him every day. I hope you open the word every day to read his word, not with this attitude, well, you know, I'm supposed to be a good Christian and read my Bible today. What would happen if you said, God, I can't wait to hear what you have to say to me today from your word? Because every time you open that Bible and begin to read, he speaks if you'll just listen. All oh, the motive has got to be different. The motive has got to be to love him more. So two great mistakes we make. Man, we, we absolutely have the wrong master. We think we're in control of this. And man, if I'm in control, I know y'all are so much better than I am, but if I'm in control of my salvation, I'm doomed. Y'all are so much better than I am, but I'm willing to admit I can't do it. How about you? And so what does it say when someone says, yeah, I can really be in Christ Jesus. He can save my soul, and I can do something to reverse that. That means you're in control of your salvation. And if that's true, you better run away. You better find a different idea. You better get back into God's word and find out that is not true. How hard it would be to live in a system as it comes to religion, as you might say, thinking that you have something to control your salvation. Holy smokes. And yet there are billions of people on this planet as I speak right now that are living that. They think it's because they went and prayed so much or they made sure they were at this meeting that often and they made sure they stopped two times a day and faced the right direction and prayed. That that's what's gonna save them. When the word of God makes it wholly true that we can't save ourselves, only he can save us. Number three and finally, some absolute treasures. I didn't have room in this outline. Y'all looked at that outline, man, we're gonna be here all day. No, not so much. Write these down though. Three simple things. These are treasures to cling to as we close. Just some things I wanted to make sure I share with you, and we're going to come back to this text. Number one, the first absolute treasure I want you to know today is that salvation begins and ends with God. It begins and ends with God. And if you want to write this down, I think this will be good. We are as secure in our salvation as God is in being God. Did you hear me? If you are in Christ today, you're in the most secure place you could ever be. You're just as secure in that salvation as God is in the security of being who he is. Why? Because he is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the one who saves, not us. If you are in Christ Jesus today, there is not a safer place on the planet to be. Isn't that good news? Here's what the Bible says in John 6, verse 37, which we'll read again in a minute. It says, all, listen to this carefully, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. 
That's a promise from God. If you're in me, I will never cast you out. Wow. Number two, God always keeps his word. You can completely trust him. I know that's not breaking news to somebody in this room, but you need to hear this. If God makes a promise, he always keeps his promises. 100% of the time. You can absolutely trust his word. I know there's nobody in this world we can possibly trust. Every one of you have been sold a bill of goods, whether it was by somebody trying to sell you a car or a washer and dryer or somebody told you at work that if you'll give me $5, I'll give it back on Tuesday or whatever. We've all been through that. But no one can stand and give testimony today of a time that God did not keep his word to you. I can say that with great confidence. And you never will. And so listen to what God's word has to say about that. In 1 John 5, 13, a verse again that I would highly recommend that you all memorize in your life. These things, these things I have written unto you who believe on the name of the Son of God, (laughs) that you may know you have eternal life. Oh my goodness, Gnosko, to know that you know that you know that you know. I don't know who's gonna be the next president. I don't know if interest rates are coming back down ever again. I don't have any idea what the stock market's gonna do. I don't have any idea what's gonna happen in this world, but I can tell you this, I know that I know that I know that I'm in him. And that is really all that matters. These things I've written unto you that you may know you have eternal life. What a promise from God. My goodness. Number three and finally, heaven is our secure home and you will never regret serving God in this life. Heaven's our eternal home. Praise God this isn't home, amen? Praise God. You will never regret serving him in this life. I've met so many people over the years. You know, I... I just gotta go sow my wild oats and get this out of my system and then I'll come to Jesus. Hey buddy, everybody doesn't live to be old. Everybody doesn't get that opportunity. You will never, ever, ever regret loving Jesus and serving him. And so these words once again. This is Jesus He's speaking to you. He's speaking to me. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that all, not some, not most, but All that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. And then these words of comfort. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. Will have eternal life. Did you hear me? will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Aren't you glad that God's not an Indian giver? (laughs) Aren't you glad he's a promise-keeping God? Aren't you glad that when he says he'll do something, he will do it, and when he starts something, He'll finish what he started, and you are a work in progress, and I'm a work in progress, and I pray till the day that I die that he keeps working on me and honing me and helping me be more like Jesus because he said in his word that it is his desire to mold and make me more like his son Jesus with the passing of every day. What a shame we have people in this town that believe they can lose something that they never got on their own anyway. And if anyone teaches you that there's a doctrine of salvation that includes how good you are, it is a lie, it's not the truth. Because salvation is 100% a work of God. All we can do is throw ourselves in the mercy of the one who loved us so much that he gave himself for us.
Many people ask, well, how can I know that I know that I know? How can I walk in confidence that I know that I'm in Christ Jesus? What a powerful testimony this morning. Many people in Cleveland, Tennessee, are you kidding me? Everybody's a Christian in Cleveland, right? Not so much. And so would you just give me just a few minutes and look right here for just a minute. The first step in being saved is to be lost. Stay with me. If you're not lost, you don't need to be found, right? If you're not lost, you don't need to be saved. There must be a time in your life where you came to the understanding that you were lost and you couldn't fix it. For me, that was 1974. Yes, that's a long time ago. I've told you the story a thousand times, but my mom was really smart, and we always had a station wagon, and she would turn around in the car and look at us on our way home. Three boys in the back seat sitting right there. No seat belts. Can I get an amen from the congregation? <laughs> I don't even know if it had seat belts, but anyway, we'd sit there. My mom would say, well, what did y'all talk about in Sunday school, and what did y'all talk about in this? And when we got old enough to be in the church service, what did the pastor preach on that? She was, boy, she's tough. And she told me that that day, it was Mother's Day of 1974, that the way that I answered her questions that day, she could tell that it wasn't coming from my head, it was coming out of my heart. She said, Phil, you were under conviction. And it was later that day in our den that I got on my knees and gave my life to Jesus. I haven't gotten over that yet. That's been a long time ago. Here's what I knew when I got on my knees and prayed to ask Christ to save me. I knew I was lost and I knew I couldn't fix it. Are you with me? There has to be a time in your life, and it may have been a long time ago or two days ago, that you come to the place I know I am a place that I can't fix this and only Jesus can help me, which leads to step number two. Admit there's only one place you can go. Listen to me carefully. There's one place to go. Not to the priest, not to the pastor, not to the religion, not to the denomination. The Bible says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You got one place to go, his name is Jesus. And so I know I'm lost and I can't fix this and there's no way in the world I'll make this right. And all I can do is believe that there's one who can fix this. I have a place to go and his name is Jesus. The last step is to throw yourself on his mercy. That's as simple as salvation is. I told you years ago that I told this story several times recently, and I know I've told it here, but one more time. <laughs> Have you met my daughter, Faith? She's special. And we went to a concert. Y'all have heard me tell this recently. She was right here to my left, and we're watching this concert. I think it was Celtic women. We like that old uh, Irish stuff, you know. I'm, an, I'm from Dublin, Georgia, so I got a little Irish in me, right? And we're just enjoying that. I'm sure they were all dressed up, all fancy. And, and I felt this tug for all my friends that are so deep in their theology. Listen to this. Tugging on my pants. And I looked down and there's my little precious little girl. And all she could do, she just held her hands up. It's so loud, she couldn't say anything I would hear. All she did was just hold her hands up. And I knew what that meant. Daddy, will you pick me up? I can't see, Daddy. I want to see. You know what happened on Mother's Day in 1974 to God? I realized I couldn't fix it. I couldn't see. I needed help and I couldn't do anything about it. And I held my hands up and my Heavenly Father picked me up and did for me what I could never do for myself. And that's what He'll do for you. It's not about how good you are. It's about how amazing He is. And once you meet the Jesus I met, how could you ever not want to be with him? How could you not want to serve him? How would you not want to give your best for him? My friends, no one who is truly in Christ Jesus deserved to be there. And no one who is there can do anything about what Christ has done. You're as secure in Christ as you could possibly be because he is secure in who he is. He is the king of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords, and there's none remotely like him. And if you've not met him, why don't you meet him today? Why don't you run to him? Why don't you just hold your hands up and say, pick me up, Lord, I can't do this anymore. Do for me what I could never do for myself. God, these are your people. This is your church. 
I have such a great privilege to get to be a friend of these and to share the gospel with them on a regular basis. Thank you for that privilege. And God, I know most people in here would say, I, I have a relationship with Jesus. But some, God, they've been trusting in themselves and not trusting in you. Some thought it was all about how good they could be or how clean they could live instead of realizing it was all about the perfect life that Jesus lived. Some of us have had way too much confidence in our own ability and not enough confidence in your ability. Thank you that you wrote these things down so that we could know that we know that we know we have eternal life. If there's anyone in this room, God, that does not know that they know that they know, may today be the day. May today be the day they cry out to you, confess their sin before you, and ask you to save their soul. Oh, God, thank you that salvation is not dependent upon us, but it's dependent upon the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. Knowing, Father, that's the most secure place we could ever be. Do your handiwork in this invitation, Father. Speak to our hearts. In Christ's name I pray.